Hey church, what's up? <clears throat> Why don't you open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5, okay? <clears throat> um, I'm excited uh, to be here with you guys tonight. And um, this is the last in, um, in a series. And I know that when I started to study for the last of the series, I had this this angst inside of me to blow through it and get to the next thing because I'm super excited about it. Um, but I don't want that to be the case tonight for you. Um, God slowed me down and said, hey, man, if every word is mine, then every word's important, whether it's at the beginning of the book or at the end, it's important. Listen up, kid. And so I'm just asking you that you'll do that same thing here tonight just because it's the end of the series need to know I think there's some things here tonight that you need to know and so I hope that you'll listen intently and uh, just try to hear the voice of God speaking to you okay so uh, our Bibles I, I hope are open to first John chapter 5 we need to know some things and uh, that's why I wrote this book and this short letter uh, five chapters you can read it in 15 minutes but it's months and months and months uh, of learning there and we've been months doing just that, and uh, I'm excited about tonight, though. So uh, 1 John chapter 5, we're going to just read uh, the last little section right there, starting in verse 13. You guys all have a copy of God's Word in front of you? Okay. Um, don't just listen to me. Listen to God. He's, he's wrote a book. It's right there for you. Um, so you guys ready to read? Yeah. All right, here we go. So this is uh, the Apostle John, uh, wise sage of the faith, been around, done some things, heard some things, experienced some things, and he's writing these things. He says, I've written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so you may know you have eternal life. That's where we gain uh, our, our title, Need to Know. He's writing this stuff. What stuff? He's writing this stuff in this book, five chapters. So five and a half chapters, he's ta taught us some things, and he's taught these things to people who are believers because, um, you know, we learned this the last couple weeks. You, just because you're a believer don't mean you're a Christian, right? Right? Remember our buddy Legion? He bowed down before Jesus and said, you're Jesus, the son of the most high. Like, he believed who he was. He ain't no child of God. And so John's like, listen, I'm, I'm writing to you who are, who are believers so that you'd know you have everlasting life, right? There's more to this thing called salvation and eternity than just believing in who Jesus is, okay? And so he writes these things. Let's just read on, verse 14. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our requests, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. That's a bold statement, isn't it? Um, especially in the hands of... of um, People that are broken, that's a bold statement to receive, but we'll talk about that. If you see a Christian brother or sister sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray. And God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. Boom. Uh, all wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come. That was a great place for an amen. Let me go back here. Let me back it up a little bit. I'm going to read this again just to so make sure you guys are awake. Uh, and we know that the Son of God has come. That was a C at best. All right. Is the amen girl in here still? Okay. You can help the rest of them, Okay. And we know that the Son of God has come, Amen. and he has given us, <laughs> there we go, and he has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God. There we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he is eternal life. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. So I've written these things, John says. I've written these things to you who believe. Um, 
so that you know you have eternal life. And so it's kind of interesting because for five and a half chapters, he's telling us all this stuff we've been learning for the last three or four months. You know, you've been here. And so, you, you know, he's telling you, like, if you really want to be saved, you're really saved. You're this, you're this, you're this. It's not just believing. But what's funny is that immediately after he finishes that sentence, he starts talking about something that has really seems to have nothing to do with salvation. It's kind of weird. He just goes, puts on the brakes completely. Like, I've written this stuff to you, but I'm coming to the end of my letter, and i got to let you know this, 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 this. Remember last week? Boom, 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 boom. He's coming to the end of his letter. He goes into total ADD mode, and he's like, I need you to know this and this and this, and my bus is about to end, and the timer, and I need to. And and so he just goes away from this whole salvation thing, and he starts talking about prayer and the type of prayer that, that that God is inclined to listen to and act on. And we should be listening to that, right, because that's super, super important. And here's the thing. The prayer that pleases him, the prayer that pleases him is the prayer he hears and answers, right? And, and, I, and I was talking to Pastor Jay the other day, and it's so true, and I'm guilty of it too. You guys are all guilty of it. You ready to know what you're guilty of? Like, just let's just be honest in church, right? Let's have a little fun. Let's just call each other out. It's good to make fun of ourselves, right? Don't you agree that when you spend time in prayer, most of it is, God, I need this. I need that. I need that. Please heal me. Please provide for me. Please protect me. Please save my son. Please, please do all this stuff that I need to do. Right? I need this. I need it. So please help me. And I, it, God wants to be that provider for you, right? Doesn't he? But that's what we spend most of our time doing. We're, we're praying for stuff that pleases us. I'm, I'm, I'm hurt. I'm sick. Help me. Right? That's awesome that you want to be helped. But have we stopped and said, wait a minute. Like, I know that pleases me, but... What about what pleases him, right? What about what pleases him? See, we're, he's, he's trying to do stuff, and I found, he's trying to do stuff in our life, right? And so what does he do? He starts coming to you. I'm going to pick on you, Don. You sit up front, and you're big and strong. He comes, and he picks on you, and he starts doing this. He starts applying the pressure, right? So what do we do? I rebuke you. I rebuke that sickness. I rebuke that oppression. Get out of my life. And God's like, no, that's what I'm doing to make you better. Right? That's what's happening. So we need to know what pleases him. Maybe praying away the, the, the sickness or the pressure is not what pleases him. Maybe what pleases him is if you'll shut your mouth, listen to what he's saying, and do what pleases him. Learn something. Right? Maybe that's what he wants. I'm just saying, I'm just throwing it out there, right? I'm not just picking on you, right? That's me too. I'm rebuking with all my rebukers I can when, when things are coming my way. And I'm learning something here. You should, the, the word of God should take the preacher to the mat before it takes you. And so I'm learning something big time here. Because I need to, 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 to ramp up my prayer life. I'm sick and tired of praying and, not, and things don't happen. I'm just, just sick and tired of that. It's because you're praying for the wrong stuff. And so am I. So we pray for stuff that pleases us. God doesn't do it because it doesn't please him. And we start going, well, maybe he doesn't hear me. Or maybe I just don't. Listen, this, this one's tragic. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Tragedy, tragedy. Er, 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 time out. Don't think that, right? Maybe it's just because it's not pleasing to him. Like, we all prayed that someone would get healed, and then God takes them. We're like, oh, dang, it didn't work. Some of us have experienced that, right? If you have enough faith and you do this, because these signs will follow the apostles and all the, d- the believers that they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. So you lay hands on the sick and the dude dies. Well, dang. Maybe God's not real. Maybe God doesn't hear me. Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. So the prayer that pleases him is the prayer that he hears and answers. We see that in the text. We read it, right? What does it say here? Um, We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him, right? So he he goes on some steps here. He says, step one, um, he'll hear us if we ask for things that please him, right? And since we know he hears us, then it's safe to assume that he's going to, Uh, When we make these requests of these things, the things that please him, uh, we know that he's going to give us what we ask for, right? So, So what do we do then? Okay, so maybe I need to stop asking for stuff that pleases me, and and, and I need to figure out what what pleases him. So, um, so what you do is you when you when you want to learn about what pleases the Lord, you look up in the Bible about things that please the Lord, right? So if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 10, it just simply says this, carefully determine what pleases the Lord, right? 
That's in your face. That's just, that's just, uh, how many, you need a seminary degree to figure that one out, right? Carefully determine what pleases the Lord, right? So, but, 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 but listen, I don't know what translation you're reading. I'm reading the New, New Living. I like this whole carefully thing. That means it, you know, like you don't just breeze by it. You don't just uh, grab the cliff notes. You don't just uh, get some hearsay or, you know, hey, it sounds Christian. Uh, you know, she told me this one time and he said, mentioned something one time. And no, carefully determine. Carefully, right? So just think about that. Like we're supposed to meditate on God's word. So if you meditate on carefully determine what pleases the Lord, that should make you start thinking about some things. Like you should start seeing yourself sitting down at a table with a notebook and a Bible and a concordance and a coffee. And you start thinking like, okay, carefully. Like that, that carries with it time spent, right? Detail, right? You want to, listen, if you want him to answer your prayers, you need to know, carefully determine what pleases him, right? So, so where, do we where do we find that? Anybody? In the word, In the word right? right? That should, that's, that's an easy answer for this church all the time. No matter what I ask, just say that, the Bible, right? It, it's, it's, you, you, you carefully determine what pleases the Lord, okay? So, so then, then, listen... So he, so this, so so Paul, he said this in Ephesians five ten, right? So this same guy Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing one book, right? This is one book, in First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians four one. He's let me let me read it to you. I want you to hear the exact. I, I have my little, you know, paraphrase over here, but that's not going to cut it. I want you to see what it actually says. First Thessalonians four one. He says this. Finally, dear brothers and sisters. We urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God, right? So for, first you carefully determine it, right? You pick up your Bible, you start digging out what he wants, what pleases him, right? Then once you've established that, okay, I got my list. I understand what makes you happy, Lord. And then Paul says, okay, once you've done that, now I want you to live that out. He says, to live a way that, in a way that pleases God. As we have taught you, and then he says this, I love this, you live this way already. So, so, so he's not saying, hey, you're all a bunch of heathens. He's not saying that, right? All you devil worshipers out there, right? All you atheists. No, 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 he's not saying that. He's saying to the believer, he sent it to the Christ follower. You're, you're living this way already, but we encourage you to do so even more. See, see some of us are living in our past. Some of us have had great faith, and we used to serve, and we used to pray the right way. We used, to, we used to be all in on God's program. We kind of slipped away from that. And he's like, listen, I, you do live this way. You're, you're a good disciple. Like, you do, you do. You do all right. But listen, I'm calling you ever higher. No matter who you are, no matter how much you've been walking with the Lord, how long, how deep, how abiding you can do, there's always room for improvement. Nobody's ever made, including mostly the guy who's just yelling at you right now. And I feel called up again by reading that. So I'm supposed to carefully determine what pleases the Lord. And then once I've determined that, now I have to live it out. So how do we have an, uh, this powerful, effective prayer life that God desires for us? H how do we do that? Well, very simple. We don't have to get too technical. You ask him for stuff that he always hears and answers. That's how. If you're, if you're tired of praying, you're like, nothing's happening. Is, is, there, is this Christianity thing even for real? Is it legit? Well, why don't we start seeking out what pleases him and start praying for those things? Because there's certain things, God's answering that prayer every single time. Every single time. He can't deny himself, okay? So there's a promise given. Right, the promise is, if we pray for the stuff that pleases him, he's going to hear us, and then he's going to answer it. He's going to actually rule favorably, if you will. Right? He's going to act favorably on your behalf. So promise is given, but there's a process required. And I'm not going to get all legalistic. I don't want you to think that's where the church is going. Oh, you have to do five steps to this and ten steps to that. No, it's not, but here's some things that I think will help, okay? The first step, we've already said it. We have to carefully determine what pleases him. 
Like I said, time in his word. Okay, don't just guess. Don't just listen to some preacher on TV. Don't just listen to me, right? Get into the word of God. If you want to see God move supernaturally, powerfully in your life, often as he desires to do, you have to do it his way. And if you, if you try to circumvent the system, you're never going to see the results that you or he wants. So you have to do it his way. So we have to carefully determine what pleases him by studying in his word what makes him happy. And now here's the second thing. Step two is you have to believe. You have to believe that what you're praying about or for is what truly pleases God and that he will respond. You have to believe it, okay? It, it, listen, just researching it doesn't, that doesn't cut it. You can carefully determine it all day long. Like you can look and look and look and make some notes out of the holy book. But if you don't believe that what you've just read is the word of God and that it truly does please him and that he truly will hear you and respond, you get this. Nothing. Here, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pleasing the Lord, right? Here's the ultimate verse. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Right? You can learn what pleases him all day. But if you don't have faith to believe that that is what pleases him and that he will hear it and he will respond, you get nothing. So there's a story also in the book of Hebrews. You can check it out later if you want. It's in Hebrews chapter 4. And God is talking about how... Um, He's offered rest to people, right? So there was rest like, um, there was uh, Sabbath rest, right? There was, that was a day. And then there was um, um, ge uh, geography rest, right? The promised land, right? They're going to go into this place of rest. That was a place. And then there's Jesus, which is a person, right? So the, all these opportunities for the rest for your soul, right? And so he goes on, he says that, God has promised rest to people, but in, in Hebrews 4, uh, verse 2, he says, but to some it did no good because they didn't combine what they heard with faith. You see what I'm saying? You have to combine what you hear. Like, so God makes a promise. He says, I will listen and respond to the prayers of my people if they're pleasing to me. Like, that's the promise. So what he says here is, like, you, you, you heard this, right? You read it. You heard it. You know it. But if you don't combine what you heard with believing that it's actually what makes God happy and praying that way, you get nothing. It does them no good unless you combine what you hear with faith, okay? So, again, researching what pleases God isn't sufficient, you believing what you researched is key to ensuring that you have a, an audience with God and that he will respond favorably, okay? That's what the word of God teaches us. Now, I'm going to put something on the screen. I want you to write this thing down. I think it will be very helpful for you. Here's, everyone has a definition of faith, but here's a practical application of faith, and I think it will help you, okay? You see it up there on the screen. Faith means this. It means that I believe what his word says about what pleases him. And I believe he is going to hear and respond to me when I pray for help with these things. Right? With these things, I believe that his word is true. Right? Right? And I believe if I pray these things, he's going to respond. You have to believe that, okay? That's faith. That's faith in action. Listen, the Bible says in Romans 12 that God gives faith. You don't conjure it up. You can't have it imparted by someone else. God gives faith. But you have to take that faith that he's given you and put it into action. You have to make a choice of your will. Listen, I believe what that book says. I believe that it's his word. I believe that, if, that it pleases him. I believe if I pray that, he'll hear me. And I believe that if I pray it, not only will he hear me, he will respond to me favorably. That's faith in action. So, 
what prayers please and move God every single time. I mean, there's some that actually move him every single time. He has to move. He has to move, okay? So, so, so that would be like step three would just be like pray right, right? The first one is carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Second, believe it, have faith, right? And the third one is pray the right stuff. Pray the right stuff, okay? So context is everything. When you're studying the Bible, right, you should, you should always uh, see what's just before it, just after it, right? Context is super, super important. Like, um, for instance, I, I've heard this often, like, um, people always say when, um, I don't need to go to church because when two or more are gathered in his name, I'm there in his midst. Okay, that's stupid, okay? He's there in the midst with you when you're alone because his spirit lives in you. Okay, so can we just end that? And second of all, if you read that section of scripture, it's under the, in the context of, of, of church discipline, okay? It's about like when like two people from the church, like Mr. Elder A and Mr. Elder B, go to the person and hear the situation and know what's going on and they bring an accusation. You bring in the accusation with the power of the Lord. It's church discipline, so don't just throw that out. Ever. Like context is super, super important, okay? So... In that section, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul's talking about, you know, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Okay, what stuff, what stuff is Paul talking about all around that, right? What, what was he talking about before it? What's he talking about at? What's he talking about right there, right? So if you want, you can open up your Bibles there to, to turn, turn back to Ephesians chapter 5. And, and, and let's look. Let's see what actually pleases the Lord, right? That's why he says carefully determine. He's, he's mentioning some stuff here. Okay, look at, um, look at, look at start, start out right here. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his dear child. Okay, so he's talking to believers. He says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Okay, like, this should be no surprise to you guys. We've just spent the last four months reading 1 John. Right, so lo living a life filled with love should be like, hey, well, that's something new. I didn't know that, right? Definitely not. Uh, okay, so, so what, what, what is he talking Live a life that's filled with love, like, lo like love like crazy. It should be like a love felt. Like, I'm not graduated here, man, but I'm just saying that we should have a life that is filled with love for the Lord. Love the Lord God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor. Love the people that are, are from your from your church, especially, like, right here together, love them, your neighbor, like crazy, right? Love them, like, love them like crazy. And he says, but do it like Jesus did. So how did Jesus do that? Loves the guy who's spiking his hand? Are you kidding me? So loving the unlovable, the sinner, the one who's, who's not living up to your expectation, that's what we're supposed to do, Right? And, and, and then, then it goes on, after he says, love, love like Jesus did, look what he goes on to say. Um, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, right? That's love. Love isn't just like, hey, Matt, I love you, man. That's not love. Like, that's one way to kind of say it, but that's like, you know, what have you done for me lately, right? What is, what is I love you, man? What if, show me, right? So Christ, that's what he does. He shows. He shows his love by sacrificing himself, right? He's serving us. He came to serve us, right? Jesus Christ serving you. Like that's what he, that's, that's real love. Not just, hey, I love you, man. For God so loved the world, he sent his son. That's awesome that he said it, but he actually does. He gives himself over as a sacrifice for us, right? And so that's what real, real love is serving other people. That's what real love is. And that's at the middle of our name here, revolution. That's the greatest weapon of the revolution is love. And so our church should be marked with great servants of the Lord, right? Offering myself uh, as a servant, serving more, serving better, serving longer, right? It should cost something, right? That's what real love is. You think God wants us to live, to live that way? Of course he does. So if you ask him for that, you think he's going to help you? Of course, right? How about 
Just let's just read on, right? Carefully determine what pleases him. Very next verse. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Sexual purity, man. I, like, the Bible says we should live a life worthy of the gospel. Like, just think of what Jesus did. Just think about this. The Bible also tells us that when you join your bodies to a prostitute, that you're joining, your, you're joining Jesus to that prostitute. So in that same idea, if you're, if you're watching porn, if you're flirting with someone, it, it, what, whatever, whatever it is that is immorally wrong, sexual, like that's a big, you're joining Jesus to that. Do, do you understand? So do you think God wants us, do you think he would want to help you with that? Right, absolutely. Jesus doesn't want to hook up with a prostitute. He, he doesn't want to cheat. He doesn't want you cheating on your bride just like he doesn't want his bride cheating on him and he doesn't want to cheat on his bride, right? He doesn't like that. So, so he, he says, listen, no sexual immorality, no impurity. That's not for us. And so lead me, Lord. Help me. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Like that's a prayer he's going to hear and he's going to respond to every single time, don't you know? Absolutely. He goes on, he says, listen, not just that, but no greed, right? No greed. He says, um, let there be no sexual immorality, no impurity. And impurity too, like that can mean a lot of things, right? Like that can mean a lot of things. That can mean only have one God, yo. Only one. Pure. Pure, right? Don't, I, listen, no divided mind, no divided heart. I'm just quite sure that, that, that the Lord isn't letting anybody with a divided loyalty into heaven. He is not. He will not share his glory with another, right? So that's impurity too, right? Then he also says, or, no greed. No greed among you. So just thinking about that, like, what would happen if God, if you just prayed, like, God, um, I know we live in a country that, that, that is after gain and the things of this world. And, the, and First John warned us about that. You know, the, the lust of the eyes, I want that. The lust of the flesh, I, I need, it's going to feel good. I need to gather that up. Or, and then the pride of life, the pride of accomplishment. Look at I, look at I made. Look at who I am. Look at I've experienced. Look at my long list of women and my and my great job and all the great stuff I have. And look at me. Look at me. Like that is of the world. And 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 so God's like, quit with the greed. And I think, listen, loved ones, I don't step on your toes, but listen, I think some of that prayer time. That's a little greedy sometimes. I'm just saying, just throwing it out there for your consideration. We think about what we need, right? We think about what we need. Instead of saying, hey, man, what pleases you, Father? What, what, what do you want, right? Instead of what do I want, what do you want? You know, I'm praying for this. He, listen, I, there's, a, there's a guy I know. You may have seen him on Facebook. I don't know. He, he's got this injury in his neck. And he's been to every single church, and he went straight, like, you know, I'm not picking, but just listen up, okay? Just be real in church. Like, there's some church groups that are a lot more charismatic and more, like, let's pray for this thing. We're going to get it done, right? We're going to pray. We're going to pray, and when we lay hands on you, we're pouring oil on you. It's getting done, right? You know some churches that are more like that. You go to the old traditional Southern Baptist church, not going to happen too often. You go up the road to the Assemblies of God. They're all speaking in tongues. They're praying. You're getting healed, right? That's just the way it is, right? I understand that there's different ways of church, right? So this guy goes to every single group. Try, he went out to the Send. He went out to Jesus, move, uh, Jesus Image or whatever. All these famous evangelists and faith healers and all this stuff and praying. Then he went to a small group and he went to an outreach over in Deland. Pray, pray, pray. Oil, hands, nothing. Until he got home got on his knees and said, Father, if it's your will to heal me, then heal me. If it's not, let me do ministry powerfully through my injury. He hasn't had any pain since. Right? It's what pleases him. That's vertical church. Okay? Not what pleases us. What pleased him was 
please, for the love of God, take my pain away. <laughs> right? right? Isn't that what we all want? Take my pain away. Cure me, heal me, fix me. And, and, but when he finally said, I just want to have a servant's attitude, whatever you, you, your grace is sufficient, whatever you want, I'm yours. I'll, I'll, I'll preach anyway, even in pain. That's when he got healed because that's what pleased the Lord, not what pleased him, all right? So no greed, no sexual immorality, no impurity. Um, look, let's just read on. Um, such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Like this is, um, man, this is all me right here. Confession in church. Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. Right? This is my area right here. Like, we all know no one's supposed to be dropping F-bombs, right? We all, I think we can all agree there, right? Yeah, but it doesn't even say that, right? <laughs> it comes down to our little stupid level, right? Because we're like, well, I'm not dropping the F-bomb. You know, but, I, but I'm doing this. You know, I, you know and I, I'm the worst, right? I'm the worst. You hang out with me, I, I, I'll bring you right down. I'll bring all the time, right? Bring you right down. And I joke around with some of you guys. Like we're still in the play. Or they just, I, and again, I'm not like cussing like a sailor, but that's not what it even says. It's saying, hey, all that stuff that you make light of, that you think is no big deal, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And, and like I understand the Bible says, let no, let no unclean word come out of your mouth except words that would edify people. Like build them up. Build up the kingdom of God, right? Not just break it down. And he's saying these things here, like, a coarse joke, foolish talk. I'm the king of foolish talk. Like, I don't do a whole lot of obscene stories anymore. I don't do a whole lot of coarse jokes, but foolish talk is my thing, man. Anyone with me? Don't leave me hanging up here. <laughs> Michael, you need to be raising your hand, man. Right? Come on now, right? Oh, okay, there you go. She raised her hand for you. Yeah. So, so like, that's my thing, right? But he says, like, these are not for you. So, so maybe, you know, hey, God, like I like talking stupid, you know, but help me not do that. Like I want to honor you with my mouth. I want to be the guy that everything that comes out of his mouth is edifying. You know what I mean? Like I, I want to be, God, God, I want to be the guy that everyone wants to run into. Not the guy that they see in Walmart and go, oh, boy, did he see me? Y'all laughing because you do it. I want to be that guy. You think God wants that? I think so. Okay, so let's just read on, right? Um, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. I mean, that's all over the Bible. I mean, just do, a, just do a study on that. You'll be there for months. I think it's in 1 Thessalonians. It's God's will that we are to be thankful. Right? To, that we are to be thankful. If you go down just below the verse that we talked about, about um, finding out what ple carefully determine what pleases the Lord, look down in verse 18. Don't be drunk with wine. And for the ones who are in here going, well, I don't drink wine, I drink beer, G get over yourself. We'll have to just make a new translation, the Lake County edition, and it'll have it in there, okay? Don't be drunk with wine. Is, okay, I'm just going to go out on the limb and just be honest in church here, right, because a lot of people might not want to do this, but is it okay to have a drink? Is alcohol forbidden? Not at all. Not at all. Um, Jesus turned water into wine. Paul told Timothy, hey, you got a bellyache problem. Have a little wine. It might help rest, rest your stomach. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you get drunk with wine, that's a problem. Because as we've probably, I don't know, maybe all of us in the room know that when you get drunk with wine, you're no longer in control. Something else is controlling you, and you start doing stupid stuff. We've all done it, so we're all guilty, right? We're all in this together. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. We've all experienced some of that, I know. 
Um, don't be drunk. One of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Self-control, right? Control. Like Christians shouldn't be running around out of control. There should be some order to your life, right? Not craziness. And so, um, so God says, listen, don't be out of, don't let something control you, right? But then look, instead of letting wine, and you can put anything in there, right? Wine, beer, whiskey, whatever, weed, coke, meth, whatever your chosen stupidity is, don't be drunk with that stuff because it will ruin your life. We can all attest to that. He says, but instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and listen, that doesn't mean, a lot of people take that as, and you see them in church, and they're drunk in the spirit, and they're all being crazy again, right? That's not control. That's not control, okay, at all. It, it, it's, he wants, he doesn't want your chosen addiction to be anything other than him. What you choose to obey becomes your master, and so he doesn't want you to, he wants, he doesn't want wine or whatever to be controlling what you do. He's, he wants the Holy Spirit to be controlling what you do. And the Holy Spirit isn't going to make you act like you're drunk on wine. Right? That's not going to work. Right? This should be something distinctly different between someone who's being controlled by the Lord than someone who's hammered on Budweiser. Okay, so we need to d distinguish between the two. He wants, to be he wants us to be controlled by the Lord. The scripture says, let the Holy Spirit control every part of your life. So if you pray for that, God rushing in on that one? Yeah. Absolutely, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Next verse. Wh wh why, why does he want you to be filled with the Holy Why does he want your new addiction to be the Lord, right? And what is that going to look like? You're going to be drunk and stupid and foolish? No, look what it looks like to be drunk with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your heart. Man, that's what being filled with the Holy Spirit is. But being filled with the Holy Spirit is when, when Paul clicks that button here in a minute or, or Haley clicks that button, that's what you're doing. You, you're fully immersed in worshiping the Lord, praising him, singing songs to him. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That's what a, when a person walks into the church gathering, they don't want to see a bunch of people, you know, controlled by the Holy Spirit, flopping around being crazy. No, you walk into a room and everyone's praising the Lord, passionately singing songs like it says. That is what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your heart. And then what's that? And then look, again, here it is. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, be thankful. All these things I listed, live life full of love, serving others greater, sexual purity, um, sexual morality, no greed, guarding my tongue, being thankful, don't be drunk with wine, but be, have a new addiction, being the Lord, right? And then singing passionately for him. All the, like, think, you think if you pray for those things, you think God's going to rush in and help you with that? Yeah. Right? right? So, so instead of praying for stuff that pleases us, that we need, hey, I need this word, how about what, I, what, how about what God needs? How about what God wants, right? Let's just pray for those things. So, um, and we, so we go back to the text, and we are, or let's just make it personal, right? Let's just make it personal. And I am confident that God hears me when I ask for anything that pleases him. And since I know he hears me, ask for these things, then I know he will give me what I've asked for. That's what we're shooting for right there. That's the sweet spot. God's answering these prayers every time, right? If you carefully determine what pleases him, it says he'll hear it and he'll respond to it. That's a promise of the star breather. And you know he's never lied to you, right? And so we've carefully determined what pleases him. If we, if we pray those things, he's going to hear it and he's going to move on it, right? That's a good place for an amen. 
Okay, he wants these things growing in his church all the time. Okay, now here's another, here's another prayer. Absolutely, it's from the first John text. Here's another prayer that God answers every single time. Look at 1 John 5, 16. Let me grab a drink real quick. Okay, 1 John 5, 16 says this. If you see a Christian brother or sister sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. Now, I'm just going to tell you that I can't give you an answer of what that sin is. And I can't give you an answer, although some of, them, some of you might off the cuff quickly say something because you believe it, but I don't know, tell you, you know, what sin is he talking about here? Like what style, what sort of sin is, is John talking about? Because then he goes on and says, that, but there is one that like leads to death and you shouldn't pray for that dude, right? Don't pray for that brother. Like I don't even know, I, I'm sure that that answer is in the scriptures. Like I get that. And some of us probably have some ideas, you know, the one that blasphemes the Holy Spirit, or you know, maybe that guy, or maybe killing, or rape, or whatever. We all have our own chosen little theologies, but we're not going to do a study on that right now. But let, let's, just, let's just say this. In verse 17 says, all wicked actions are sin. So, so, so let's, just not, let's not label the sin that John's talking about. Let's just say this. It, it, it says there in the text that, that if you pray for a brother who's stumbling, God's going to help him. He's just, he's going to, he's going to help. I mean, you see it right there in the text, right? If you see someone, he's sinning, and you pray, God will give him life. So, but, but look, look, let's look up here, okay? That isn't a guarantee that the brother is going to respond well and always stop the sin, okay? Like we all, and, and we, we all know that brother, right? <laughs> we all got somebody. We all know, right? You're thinking about him right now, right? What about the guy in the mirror? Right? What about the guy in the mirror? What about, the, uh, well, hold on. Just like it says in this translation, what about the girl in the mirror? Ladies aren't off the hook, right? It's easy to point out somebody else's problem, but it's not easy to point out yours. But I have sin in my life, and I'm quite sure that some of you have probably seen it, and you pray for me. So the promise of God is that if a brother's in sin or a sister's in sin and you see it and you pray, God's going to rush in and give that person life, right? And so I just have to admit, and I know I'm not alone, that I've had God ministering to me powerfully, right? I, 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 he just prompted me with these thoughts, right? These, this, and, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I know what I shouldn't be doing, and, or, or, or he's ministering to me through somebody that I know, love, and trust. And they come up to me and they, get, they walk to my office with their Bible in their hand. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> chapter and verse, chapter and verse, right? And, and, and that's what you said, preacher. Don't come to me with your opinion. Come with a chapter and a verse. So God's ministering to me through a person or, or I'm reading the word. And, and uh, I see something there and I'm like, ah. And God's really working on me right then and there, right? And I just go, Heisman. <laughs> right? Don't we all? Admit it. Confession of sin in church is healthy. You'll find healing. <laughs> so God's ministering to you because, listen, someone probably prayed for me. Someone probably prayed for you. Someone probably prayed for you. And so God responds to his word. He rushes in to give that person life. But I just chose death. Again, you know the Bible says two times there's a way that seems right to man, and the end it leads to death. I just, I, I know what I'm supposed to do. I see it. I've been told. I'm prompted by the Spirit. I know, and I just choose death again. Over and over and over and over again. It's nothing new. God said that in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I've set before you life. And death, now choose life. Choose, right? He's like, listen, I, I'm offering you the better, right? You don't have to do it. I'm telling you you should, right? It's going to work out better for you if you do it my way. I'm, some, listen, Haley prayed for you, man. Paul prayed for you. Kim was praying for you. He saw something in your life that was wrong. And, he, and they prayed. And so God's like, all right, Kim, I got that. I heard what you said. I'm going to go help Kathy over here. Now choose life. You got to make a choice, right? 
So just because someone prayed and God heard it because it pleased him, he heard it, he wants that for that sinner, so he goes after and says, hey, I want to help you. Let me give you an avenue out. Kathy still has to make a choice. We still have to make a choice. That's this whole idea of free will. Dang it. That's, a, that's, a, that's an Old Testament scripture. That's like way back, like way, way old school, right? Deuteronomy. But in the New Testament, nothing's changed. Here we are 2,000 years later. Nothing's changed. Place before you life and death. Now choose life. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Right? Someone prayed for you, man. And here I am. And I'm trying to help you. And then what do we do? Stifle, stifle, quench, stop, uh, ignore, whatever word you want to use. It doesn't, I don't even know what the King James says. Something with an S at the end of it, I'm sure. <laughs> ignore, don't ignore us, the Holy Spirit, or something. Don't stifle us. Whatever is, don't do us. Never confuse God offering life with results. Because we are offered and we get to choose, okay? So let's ramp up our prayer life here at Revolution Church. Let's ramp up our life by starting to ask for stuff that pleases God, that advances His purposes. I can tell you this. Now, we gather on Monday nights here at our church for prayer. You know that, right? Most of y'all don't come, but we do have it. And I'm just going to tell you, if you've been coming, and when you come starting this week and moving forward, it's going to taste a lot different. It's going to taste a lot different. We're going to spend a lot less time asking God for the stuff that you need. And we're going to start seeking his joy and his pleasure and finding out what, what he wants in the word of God. And that's what we're going to pray for. I, I, I'm convinced wholeheartedly that, that God cares more about your spiritual development than you being healed of your cold. Okay? I think he's more concerned with your spiritual development than he is whether you live or die. That's bold, but it's true. He, you know, remember Mr. Greg, I shared that with you, right? He's dead, right? But he was so ready for death. And no matter what happened, what would he say? Come on, let's hear it. Do you guys know? Truly blessed and highly favored. When, the, when, when he wakes up two days before he dies, lost all of his weight, couldn't breathe on anything on his own, and he wakes up, looks at Pastor Jay, and Jay says, how you doing, Mr. Greg? What does he say? That's way more important, obviously, than his life. Because God said, we're done. Close the curtains, man. We're done. Right? He's, he was, did we want him to live? We prayed. I want him. He's one of my best friends. I love the guy, right? I miss him. But it doesn't even matter, because that doesn't matter. What matters is your spiritual development and maturity. That's the stuff that really pleases the Lord, because that's what advances his kingdom. Healing your broken ankle might not help his kingdom grow. <laughs> Paying your rent might not make his kingdom grow. Right? He wants his kingdom to grow, okay? So let's ramp up our prayer life here at the church. I just want to start, listen, I just want to start praying for stuff that I know is going to get answered. Instead of like hoping and wishing for great things that God's like, what are you even talking about? Like, please, right? What about the stuff that pleases me, right? Can we get, can we, like, when we pray, can we like have God involved? You know, that's what he's looking for, right? All right, so listen, so here's two more things. We're getting to the end of the study, okay? Two more things, like this one is like super practical. Right? No theology involved here. Like super, super practical, all right? And so I want to be super practical with you too. Look at verse 18. Uh, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning. Okay? Cut it out. Can you like, move on? Like, I mean, what do you, right? What do you? I mean, I give you like some world famous preacher and like expound on that and give you all these different Old Testament stories and experiences in my own life. I just cut it out, man, right? And, and so here's, here's super practical. If you go back to chapter 3, verse 8, you don't have to go there, but you can, you can let He says this, the one who keeps sinning belongs to the devil. Do we need to expand on that in any way? Like, cut it out. Like, we don't make a practice of sinning. That doesn't mean that you, you're not going to sin. 
It doesn't mean you haven't sinned. It doesn't mean you're not going to sin. It's just like not your practice. It's not what you go into work for every day. This is what I do, right? This is my practice. This is my, this is my program. This is what I do. You know, church on Sunday, and then, you know, Monday through Saturday, I just get to be whatever, like I used to be. And listen, you're here on Saturday night, so like, okay, I get that. Don't think you pulled a fast one on me. Saturday night too, right? I don't go to church on Sunday. Saturday too, right? Like, I, that, that's not the way a Christian lives. Just because they have a, a chain with a cross or a bumper sticker, you don't make a practice. Like, that's not the pattern of your life. Stumbling, yes. Failing often, I'm sure. But progressing, getting better, less than you used to be, right? This should be glory to glory transformation, sanctifying you, becoming more and more like Christ. Wouldn't it be awesome if the day you rushed the altar, you just became like Jesus? No more, no more cussing, no more drinking, no more lady chasing, no more nothing, right? Just awesome, helping old ladies, everything's perfect. It just doesn't happen that way. But we should be getting better. We should be progressing towards that, being more Christ-like, less of me, more of him, right? So we should, our, our patterns should be different than they used to be. Um, he's, you know, I, just forget your confession, what happened years and years ago. Uh, forget the, the good deeds you've done in the past or the season in the rearview mirror where you're like super faithful to the Lord. Like, forget all that for a second. They, th those things may have been real and right and good. But what about 2019? What about right now as you read First John afresh? Maybe you read it 10 years ago. Now you're here again reading it. And the word of God is now speaking to you again. He's not saying, hey, you never got saved. No, he's writing to save people. But how's it going right now, right? And so this is where the idea that we've talked about in great length here the last couple of months, the idea of abiding in Christ and living in God, remaining faithful comes into play. Because look, look what it says here. It says, um, where, where are we here? Um, it says, we know that children, God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. And, and so that's the idea of abiding in Christ, because when you read that, if you rip open the Bible and just read that, what you're going to read and what you've often been taught in church is that Jesus has such a hold on you. No, I could run from him, but he's holding on to me. See, it says it right there that, that Jesus holds me securely so the evil one can't get anywhere near me. I got legit saved. The evil one can't get anywhere near me. But then you look in the mirror and you're like, well, that can't be true because I, I sinned 45 minutes ago. So what, see, the whole thing here is that, yeah, Jesus has a hold on you for sure. But let's never forget that Jesus' hold on you, his abiding in you, is directly predicated on you abiding in him. I want to believe that G when I said yes to Jesus, he grabbed a hold of me so tight that no matter what I do, he won't let go. And I, people are taught that all the time. It's just not biblical. Biblical says, if you abide in me, then I'll abide in you. So yeah, he has a hold on you, but it's because you're going after him. Okay, it's because you're going after him. So this idea of abiding and remaining in me, right, then I'll abide in you. So for clarity, please also don't hear that if you're truly saved, you won't ever sin, that the devil can't touch them even though it says that he can't, right? Don't let your theology bleed into the biblical text, ever, right? And that's a challenge for the preacher, too, because I have my beliefs, right? And so I sometimes want to impose my belief onto the Bible and try to make it Read the way I believe, and that's dangerous to do that, okay? So, so when it says that Jesus has a secure hold on you and the devil can't get near you, 
Listen, we need to rightly divide what that says. Like, I understand what it says on the surface. Like, if you just rip your Bible open and read it, you're like, yeah, I'm good. Devil can't touch me. Devil can't touch me. But the problem with that is if you haven't been here for the last couple of months, you wouldn't have been here when we preached in 1 John 1, 8. Same author, same letter, same God. He says, if, if you think, if you say you have no sin... You're fooling yourself. Have no sin. What's that, past, present, or future? Present, right? So if you say, listen, the devil can't touch me, yo. I'm, I'm with Jesus up in here. He can't touch me. Are you, so you claiming you have no sin? You're fooling yourself. And then he goes on in verse 10. He says, and those who said they've never sinned. When's that? Past. So you were sinning. You have sin now. He says, if you claim you didn't have sin, you're calling God a liar. Right? So, so don't say, well, I'm with Jesus, man, the blood. I'm saved so radically. Devil can't touch me. Oh, yes, he can. He can mess with you big time if you allow him to. And so that's why abiding and remaining and living in and continuing in this relational pursuit of Jesus is crucial. Not in order to not ever sin, because we do. But in order to prevent these sinful practices, these sinful patterns from developing in your life. Hear me. We sin. But God's children, true Christians, do not make it a practice of sin. Do you know the idea of practice carries with it intentionality? What are you doing today? This is what I'm doing. This is my plan. This is who I am. This is what I do. I make a practice of this. Right? God's children don't make a practice of sin. That's not what they do. If you abide. You don't do that if you abide. If you're in a pretty constant, intimate, like the guy who's carefully determining what, pleases the Lord, that guy. That guy doesn't make a pattern of sin, right? Because he's abiding in Christ. He's spending time with the Lord. He's in the word. He's on his knees. He's worshiping the Lord. He's serving the Lord. He's studying God's word. That's, that person is not making a, a practice of sin. So, like, how are you preparing for game day? Because we're all practicing for something, Right? There's going to be a day. Like, what are you doing? Are you preparing, practicing sin? Or are you practicing obedience? God's offering you life right now. And the choice is up to you what you're going to do. Some of you are going to choose him and say, no, I don't want to do that. Because you're thinking about the thing that you do. I'm not doing that anymore. And some of you are just going, eyes and hands. Right now in this room, I know it. Because I've been there, man. All right. Here's the last thing in the series, okay? That doesn't mean it's time to put your notebook away. Last thing. Every word of God is God breathed, right? And is useful for teaching what is right. God uses it to prepare his people for every good work, so every word is important. Last thing in the series is this, that 1 John is a warning letter. It's a warning letter to Christians, right? It's a warning letter to those that are saved, not to those who are lost. Lost people don't need these warnings. Saved people do. He makes it quite clear in his letter, in the second chapter. Well, fifth chapter, we just heard. I'm writing these things to those who believe, right? But even more so than the believers, the ones who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord. But he says in 1 John 2, 12, I'm writing these to God's children whose sins have been forgiven through Jesus. These are Christians, right? These are Christians. Chapter 2, verse 13, very next verse, he says, I'm writing this to those who are mature in the faith because you know Christ. So not just people who got saved like last, at last weekend service. I'm, talking, I'm writing these things to mature Christians, right, because they know the Lord. 
We learned this last week. To know him is to love him, is to obey him, is to love all his people. And, and so he's writing this letter to those who know God, who love God, who obey God, who love God's people. They, they worship the Lord. They've been walking with the Lord for a long, long time. Not just baby Christians. And then also in the same verse, he says, I'm also writing this to you who have won your battle with Satan. So it's quite clear who John's writing this to. And if you've embraced Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life and you're sitting in this room, then he's writing it to you. And he's writing it to me. And John warns the Christians, us, of some all too common pitfalls that can absolutely hijack and ruin a person's relationship with the Lord. Remember last week, 1 Timothy 4.1, in last days, some will abandon the true faith. You can't abandon a person you never embraced. You can't depart from a place you never were. And you can't turn from something you were never looking at. Clearly written to believers that some of you are going to turn and you're not going to be believers anymore. And he's warning, warning. And for months now, we've gone over several of these pitfalls in detail. Claiming we have no sin. What's that? Self-righteousness. I made it. Look at me. The devil can't touch me, though. What did he say about that? Fooling yourself. Disobeying God's word. This is all First John stuff. What's that mean? If the first one's self-righteousness, the second one's just self. I know what you said, but I'm not doing it. You know why? Because I like that better. I, I know I went to the aisle and I said, and I said, yes, and I'm gonna, and you're gonna be my God and you're gonna be my Lord, but not today. Not loving other Christians. The Bible just calls that hate. If you hate another brother or sister. You're not even living in the truth. So what runs you then? Hate. Hate runs you. Believer. Written to believers. How about loving stuff and experiences and boasting about it? What's running you? The world and its system. Believer. And then last week, this major, major teaching on the Trinity right there in 1 John. Because he's like, listen, the Father, the Spirit, the blood, the batches, they all testify to the deity of Christ. Don't lose sight of that, ever. That's apostasy. Don't do it. Don't do it. All these things are summed up in the very last verse of the letter. What does it say? Very last verse, dear children. Like you just, you just listen to that, dear children. Affection, right? He like he loves these people. They're not his kids, right? But he loves these people like they were their own. He's like, dear children. You can hear his heart in it, right? Keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart. So again. Boldly saying this, this is my position, and you don't have to take it. For the ones who would teach, once saved, always saved, just read that verse alone. Dear children, he's talking to believers, don't let something other than God take, don't, don't let anything take God's place in your heart. Why? Because I said it before, he's not willing to share his glory with anybody. And he's not going to let the justified who said yes was now allowed something else to be on the throne of their heart to come to his heaven. No one in heaven ever will have another idol. There's only one God. And that's it. And so all these things in the letter, like, did he ever mention a carved image? Never. He mentioned the way you live, the way you think, the way you act. Those are idols. And if anything else is on the throne other than Jesus Christ, you're not coming in. 
I don't care if you gave your life to me a while ago. What about now? You had a season of faithfulness. Maybe it was 30, 40 years. But in the last days, some of you are going to turn from the true faith. That means you were once there. And so John's like, warning, dear children who I love, don't fall into these holes. Be vigilant. That's why he says don't be drunk on wine. You've got to be sober-minded so you can pay attention because this stuff's coming. And we have to steer clear of that. All right? I want to take a few minutes, maybe even longer. I know you're probably running out of patience, but I don't care. Let's pray. Let's pray about some of this stuff, right? Let's just pray about some of this stuff. And, and then, listen, after we pray, we're going we're gonna to take communion together as a family. And, and what I, what I want to do is, is when we take communion, I want it to be a time when we make a refreshed commitment to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our own life. You know, every time we take communion, it's just to remember Him. 